Hello and welcome to the first data visualization project. So this is the first one and what we're going to be doing is creating a bar chart. So we have to build a app that's functionally similar to this. So if we just take a look at this, we have this bar chart here with a title, two axis set of bars and the bars have a tooltip for when we hover over them. And we also have some JSON data right here. So, sorry, that one. So if I just open this up in a new tab, this is the data that we get. So we have an array with dates and GDP values, and we need the dates along the bottom, GDP values along the left, and the bars like this. So what I'm gonna be doing is I'm first gonna set up a skeleton project, and then we're gonna import the D3 and everything else we need. Then we're going to import in the data. And finally, we're going to look at fulfilling these. I think we have 13 user stories throughout. So the first thing to do is I'm just going to create a new folder for this. So I'm just going to call this bar chart. Okay, so I'm going to be using a Visual Studio code for this as well. So I'm just going to open that up. Okay, so we're gonna be creating a few files for this. So the first thing we wanna do is create a HTML file to render all our graph on, and I'm just gonna create one right here. So we'll just call it index.html. And in Visual Studio Code, you can just type exclamation mark and then press tab, and it'll generate this skeleton HTML document for us and I'm just gonna give it a title of bar chart. And I also have live server installed. So what we can do is we can just launch this in live server and then we don't have to refresh. Once we save it, it'll get updated automatically. So the next thing we need to do is we need to import d3.js so we can begin using it. And the best way to do this is just to search for d3. Uh, and if I just open this up, we have this script tag right here and we can just copy and paste this. So remember script tags go in the head. So I'm just gonna paste it in right here. Cool. So then we need to import the free code camp test suite and that's this thing right over here. Oh, this thing right here. And we can import this using a script tag and there's this link to the script right here. And we wanna make sure that we render this after we render our page so that it doesn't affect our document flow. So I'm just gonna create a script tag here, src equals I'm going to paste that in and save it. Okay, so now we have the free code cam test suite. And if we look at our page over here, yep, we have it right here to perform our tests. So then what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to create a script page of our own. And I'm just going to call it script.js. And this is where we're going to write all our script. And I'm going to link it as well. And again, I'm going to link it after the body so that it only loads after the body's finished. So I'm just gonna put script src equals script.js. And yeah, so we now we have a script. And what I'm gonna do in the script is I'm just gonna log D3 just to make sure we've imported D3 correctly. So if we go to Chrome now, just have a look. Yep, we've got all the D3 methods now, so we are good to go. So next thing we're gonna do is create a little style sheet. So I'm just gonna create one right here called style.css. And I'm just gonna create a link to it. Although we're not doing much styling right now. So link, and we're gonna put style.css like this. 
Okay. So now what we're going to do is inside the body, I'm going to create an SVG tag and I'm just going to call this ID of canvas. And this is where we're going to be drawing all our SVG elements. And finally, I'm going to add a little bit of CSS just so we can see our canvas. So I'm going to give the body a display flex flex direction column justify content center and align items center so that just centers our SVG area and then I'm just going to give the SVG a background color of wheat just so we can see it oh my bad okay there we go so we've got our SVG area now so we're all ready to get now the next thing we need to do is set up some variables in our script so we're ready to use them when the time comes so I'm going to be creating some variables right here and then creating some functions and we'll end up completing these functions part way through so first one I'm going to do is create one called URL which will just be a string and this just references our JSON file, which is this one right here. So we'll be using this for when we're importing the data in as a JavaScript object. I'm also going to create a variable called rec, and that's going to be a new XML HTTP request, which is how we're going to import our JSON data. Then I'm going to create a variable called data, and that's where we'll store the response that we get. I'm going to create another one called values. And that's where we'll store the array right here of dates and GDP numbers. See, the response is a little bit more than that, but we're going to be storing this array right here inside values. Okay, so then we're going to create some scales as well. So we're going to have height scale. And height scale will be a scale that will be used to determine the height of the bars. We'll also have X scale. And X scale will be used to determine where the bars are placed horizontally on the canvas. We'll also create let X axis scale. And this scale will be used for drawing the X axis at the bottom with the dates. And we'll also create Y axis scale. And Y axis scale will be used to create the y axis along the left. Now the reason that we have separate axes to the scale is to do with some things like inversion for example and it's just better to use separate scales for the axes as well as the bars. I'm going to also create some variables width and height. I'm going to set width to 600 and I'm going to let height equals Ooh, I'm going to set width to 800 and height to 600. And this this will be just be some dimensions of our canvas. I'm also going to create something called padding. I'm going to set padding to 40. And that will just give us some room around the edges of our bar so that our maximum values fit in nicely. Okay. So now what we're going to look at is creating some selections so I'm just gonna say let SVG equals and I'm gonna call this d3 select method here and I'm gonna give it the SVG tag so what this will do is it will return the first SVG element in our document so we just have this selection that references this so this will make it easier to draw items into this canvas because we can just use SVG from now rather than doing this I'm going to create some functions now. So I'm going to create, say, draw canvas. And what draw canvas does is, I'll just show you. I'm going to actually finish this function off right here so just for ease. What it does is we're going to just call the attribute method on the SVG canvas and set its width and height to width and height. So I'm going to set the width like this. I'm going to set the height like this. And remember the attribute method, you just give it an attri a attribute to change as the first argument, and then you give it a value as the second argument. So yeah, I've just set the height and width of the SVG area. So 
Next thing we're going to do is create a, another function. And this function will be used to generate our scales. Now we need to do this first before we do any of the drawing the bars or axis because these scales will be used for those. And in generate scales, we're just going to be setting these to some scales we can use. So I'm also going to create a method called draw bars. And this method will be where the bars and the tooltips will be drawn. And finally, I'm going to create a method called generate axes. And this will be used to generate our X and Y axis. So now that we've created a skeleton project and we've created the variables and the functions, what we can now look at is importing our JSON data right here as a JavaScript object so we can begin using it in D3. Now, we already created an XML HTTP request here called a rec, and I'm just going to use this. So the first thing we're going to do is just open up the request. So I'm just going to call a rec.open. Remember, open takes in three arguments. The first argument is the method, and since we're fetching something, this method is get. The second argument is a URL of our resource, which is right here, and I've assigned this to the variable URL, so I'm just going to put URL right here. And the third argument is whether we want to run this asynchronously or not, and I'm just going to put true. Next thing we need to do is set the onload field. And remember that onload is a reference to a function to run once this request once this request has been obtained. So what this what this means is that the we have a response and the response text field has been set to our response. And then we can specify what we want it to do. And what I'm going, just going to do for now is just console.log the response text just to see if we have it. And finally, uh, we need to send, actually send this off. So I'm just going to run rec.send right here. So we've opened up a request. We've set to, to get this URL asynchronously. We've sent it off, and we've told it that once we get it back, we want to log it. So if we just take a look right here, yep, we have our response logged right here. Now, what I'm going to do is remember the variable data that I said will be storing our response. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set data equals to. And I'm going to make sure that we convert this using json.pass into a JavaScript object. So I'm going to convert this response text field that has this in the form of a JSON string. And we're going to convert this to a JavaScript object and put it into data. And then if we look here, the array we want is actually in a field called data. And what we want to do is we want to set values which I've set to an empty array to start off with, but now I'm going to set it to data dot data because data will be representing this whole response object right here. And this data field right here is the array which we want to set values to. Finally, I'm just going to log values just to make sure we have it. And I'm gonna save it and try it again. And now look, we have the actual values right here. So we have an array of items, each containing a date and a GDP value, which we can now use. Finally, instead of logging this, oh, well, I'll keep the log for now, just so we can have a look. I'm just gonna run the functions that we generated right here in the order they're intended. So first, we're gonna draw the canvas. Then we're going to generate the scales. Then we are going to draw the bars. And finally, we're going to generate the axes. If I save that and run it now, as you can see, the this function right here to draw the canvas where we set the SVG width and height has been run now. And we have this 800 by 600 SVG area that we can now work with. So now that we've imported our data into our project, we can look at starting to fulfill some of these user stories. So the first one doesn't seem too bad. All we need to do is create a title and we need to set the ID to title.
Now we're going to be drawing the title right here inside our SVG area. So I'm just going to code this straight into the HTML. We don't need to use D3 to do this. And remember to draw text in SVG, we use a text tag and we need to give it the ID of title like this specified. Now I'm going to give it some X and Y values just to position it, but you probably need to play around with this to get it to fit right at the center. So I'm just going to put the X to 350 and the Y to 30. And finally, I'm just going to give the title some inner text so it, it actually has a title. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to call it United States or USA GDP since that is what our graph is showing. So if we look now, we've created a title right here. And again, like I said, you should play with the X and Y values just to position it in the middle. So we've also, as it said, asked for an ID of title. So we've set the ID of title right here. So I'm going to try running this now to see if that passes. And yeah, we have the title with an ID of title. So we fulfilled the first user story. So before we can begin fulfilling any of the following user stories, which start off with creating the axes, we need to actually create these scales for our axes and bars to use. And I think this is the, probably the hardest part of this. So you'll have to just stick with me and I'll try and explain things the best I can. So we're going to be creating our scales right here in the generate scales method. So what we're essentially doing is we have these scales right here and I'm going to set the X and the Y. I'm going to set the domains and ranges of these scales. So the first thing we're going to do is set height scale and we're going to be using linear scales throughout. So I'm just going to call d3.scale linear. And we also need to call a domain and range on these. So domain like this. And both the domain and range take an array. So that's the important part. It has to take an array of two. So in the domain, you specify the lowest value and the highest value of the input. So the lowest value of the input is what, since we're looking at the height of the bars, the lowest value will be the minimum GDP, which can only be zero. At least in our case, it doesn't go into the negatives. So the next thing we need to do is set the maximum input and that's the whatever the maximum GDP can be. So we have a bunch of GDPs right here and we want to make find the max out of these. So what we're going to do is we're going to call d3.max here because we want to find the maximum GDP from this array. And so the first argument we give d3.max is the data set and this time it's called values. And the second argument is where it should look for the maximum. And this function takes in one of the items in the array. So it'll take in either this zero here, then it'll look at this one here. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to look for the GDP, which is stored at index one, if you look here. So we have to return item one. So yeah, so what it'll do is it'll look through all of these arrays and it'll look at this item one or index one of all of them and then determine the max of that. And that'll be the maximum domain or the maximum input value we can expect. Next, we need to set the range and the range is the range of heights that these can translate into. And the smallest height we can have for a bar would be zero. And if we think about the highest bar size, we have this height here. So height represents the 600 height that this canvas goes to. And we have padding right here. So we have padding here and padding here. So the maximum height a bar can be is height, take away padding, take away padding or height take away two times padding. So this will be height, which we've stored here, take away two times 
padding like this. Again, the max the, we're looking at what the maximum height of a bar can be, and that'll be height, take away padding, take away padding, so it doesn't touch either of these edges. So the next scale that we're going to be creating is this one called X scale right here. And the purpose of X scale is to be able to position our bars along the X axis horizontally. So I'm just going to say let X scale. Oh, we already have it. So we can just say X scale equals. And again, this is a D3 linear scale. And I'm going to set a domain and range here. So we're going to be positioning them based on the index they are. So the higher the index, the more along here we want them to be. So the domain we're looking for is the lowest and highest index. So the lowest index in this array is zero, and it's also the same in any array. The lowest index is zero. And if we want to get the largest index, the largest index will be the length of the array, which is values.length take away one because remember array start at zero so the lowest it value is the lowest index which is zero and the highest value is the highest index which is value dot length minus one then we're going to set the range to specify the range of outputs and remember the output determines which x coordinate the bar takes and if we look here the lowest x coordinate we want a bar to be at is right here so we want this padding here and then we want it here and this will be where x equals padding so the minimum is going to be padding and if we look at the maximum the maximum x coordinate that we want a bar to take so if we have this width right here it'll be width take away padding because we want this padding at the end so the largest x coordinate it can be is width take away padding so this will be width take away padding. So that determines where our bars are positioned horizontally in terms of their x coordinate. So now we're going to be looking at creating a scale to use our x axis. And remember, the x axis will be along the bottom here and we'll have dates here. So this is where we need to be a bit more careful and we need to do something that we haven't done before. So the D3 has a method called scale time instead of scale linear and what it does is it can take in date values and order them correctly which is what we want. But the problem we have right now is these dates are stored as a string so we need to convert them into numerical Unix times or like date stamps. So remember the date stamp is just a numerical value that represents a specific date. So what we want to do first is we want to create a new array so I'm going to call this dates array. And what this is going to be doing is values dot map. And I'm going to explain this in a second. So what we want essentially is to convert these into numerical date values that we can use with our scale time. So we just want to create a new array that has all of these, but then we want them into numerical date values. And that's what we're using arrays map method for. So this is a map of values. And what it will do for each item is we want, so return says what we'll have for each element in this array, what we want for each element in this new array. And what we want is we want to create a new date. So this is how we convert a string like this into a date object and we want to do is create a new date and the value you want to give it is item 0 because that's where the date string is stored so what we've basically said is create a new array and for each element in here select this first element which is item 0 convert it into a numeric date and then create a new array called dates array with it and this is the array that we're going to use for our scale so now I'm going to specify the x-axis scale and instead of scale linear, we'll use scale time. And scale time works with these date values. And well, we also want to set the domain and range. And since we're using this array for this, 
the minimum value that can be, we can have in the domain is the minimum numerical date that will be created. You know what, I'm just gonna log this just so we can have a look. Just so we can explain it better. Oops. Values. Okay, so as you can see, we've actually got them converted into proper dates. They are stored as a number, but it's just the way that Google Chrome logs it into the actual date. So what we want to do is the domain, since we're working with a x-axis scale, which will have dates along the bottom, the lowest value we can have is the lowest date right here. So we basically want to select the minimum value from this dates array right here. So this will be d3.min and we want to give it dates array. And the maximum value will be the maximum date from this array of dates. So that will be the highest number it will be represented by. So we can do d3.max and then we can give it the dates array again. Now we need to set the range. And since our axes will be directly underneath the bar, the range of the axes will be exactly the same as the range of the bars. So the x, the minimum x coordinate of the axis will be the leftmost point of the axis, and that will be where the leftmost bar is. And the maximum x coordinate will be the rightmost point of the axis, which will be where the rightmost bar ends. So again, it's between padding and width minus padding. So I'm going to open range here and then put padding with take away padding like this. So now we've created a scale for our x axis to be drawn. This will come a bit more clear when we actually draw the axis itself. So the final scale that we need to create is this y axis scale, and that'll be the scale that our y axis that'll appear on the left here will use. Now this is almost identical to the height scale, except that there is a key difference, which I will show you. So the y-axis scale looks like this. And again, it's a scale linear. And we're gonna set the domain and the range. So remember the y-axis contains a bunch of GDP numbers along here. So the lowest value we can get is going to be zero and the highest value is going to be the highest GDP. And so for that, it's the same as the height. So the highest Y value will be the highest height. So we can call d3.max, give the values array, then give a function to select the GDP. And the GDP is at index one, remember, right here, index one. So we want to return item one and now the range so this is where the difference is so if we look at the range the lowest value in the range is what we want the y coordinate because the range determines the y coordinate of the scale so the lowest value in the scale is when the scale is at zero which will be down here and this needs to be we need to push, so it'll start off here, so we need to push it down by height and then up by padding. So this will be height minus padding. So look, the this so the lowest value will be where the zero in our y-axis scale is going to be. And it'll start off at y equals zero right here. And we want to push it down to height and then we want to push it up by padding. Now the highest range is when the GDP is equal to the max GDP and that will be somewhere up here and all we need to do is we just need to push it down by padding. We're finally done with the hard part, which was generating these scales here. And if any of this was confusing, it should become a bit clearer once we start drawing the axes and the bars. So now we're going to look at continuing with the user stories. 
So we're on to user story two now. And what we have to do is create a G, which is just a general or a group SVG element. And we want to create an X axis along the bottom here. And we want it to have an ID of X axis. So we're going to be doing this in the generate axis method. And this will run after the generate scale. So we have access to these scales right here. So what I'm going to do is say let X axis equals and in terms of what d3 axis methods we use if we have the line along here we want the numbers or the ticks as they're known to be underneath the line so it's we're gonna it's on the bottom of the line so we want to use d3 dot axis bottom like this and we have to give this a scale so that is going to be the x-axis scale that we set earlier so it'll use this scale right here. And then we want to create a, it says here, it should be a G element. So we want to create this inside the canvas. So remember SVG is a selection of this SVG area. So we can generate using the append method, a G right here. And to this, what we can do is we can call we can say dot call and we can call this x axis, which will draw the x axis within this G. It also says that we need to set the ID to x dash axis. So I'm just going to use the attribute method. First argument is the attribute we're setting, which is ID. Second argument is the value, and we want to set this to x dash axis. So I'm going to save that and see what happens. So now we have this x-axis that's been created right here. So the only issue we have is we have the correct dates in the correct range. We have it positioned correctly horizontally like this. So we just need to bring it down to the right amount. So to do this, we can call a transform method. So I'm just going to give it an attribute. And the attribute with it giving it this time is a transform. And remember with transform, you can provide instructions on how we want to manipulate this chart. And we just want to translate it. And you open the brackets. So we can say translate, open the brackets like this. And in terms of the X, we're okay. We don't need to move it because it's, it's perfectly in the middle here with the two paddings. So the X can just be zero then I say zero comma, and then we'd look at how much we want to move it by it, Y. So we want to push it down all the way to around here, which is, so we want to push it down by height. Remember positive Y is downwards in SVG. So we want to push it down by height and then up by padding. So that'll be height take away padding. So we want to move it along the Y axis by height take away padding. And then what I'm going to do is just close it off. So we're going to translate it by zero on the X and then height minus padding on the Y. Hang on, what's happened? G attribute transform except a transform function, not a number. Okay, sorry, this height takeaway padding needs to be in a brackets, I think, if I do that now. There we go. See, so now what we've done is we've just moved this x axis down here to height takeaway padding. So it's in the correct position now. So, yeah, that's our x axis sorted. So, if we look at the user story, we've created a g element x axis with the id of x axis. And if I just have a look right here, we have g right here and we have the id of x axis. So I'm just going to run the tests now to see if we pass that. And if you look now, we've passed user story two. So we have a G element with the ID of X axis. Perfect.
So now we're going to look at the next user story that we're going to fulfill. And we're on user story three now. And what it wants us to do is create another G element, this time the Y axis, and give it the ID of Y dash axis. So we're going to be creating a Y axis that goes from this point right here all the way up and just have a gap of padding between the top of the SVG. So what we're going to do is first I'm going to create the Y axis itself. And I'm going to say let Y axis equals d3 dot and this time we're going with axis left because we want these numbers or ticks to be on the left side of the line so this is going to be d3 dot axis left and the scale we're going to give it is the y-axis scale that we created earlier for this so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a g element like it wanted so I'm going to append svg with a g and then I'm going to call the y-axis inside of it. So what it'll do is it'll create the y-axis and then place it inside this G or this group right here. And then we're going to set the ID like they asked using the attribute method. And this time the ID they want is y-axis. So I'm going to save that and then have a look. So we've got a y-axis right here. And in terms of the y, we're okay because look we have it ready to be lined up here and it's the correct height down as well the only issue is it's too far to the left so what we need to do is we need to just push it along and this distance right here is padding so we need to give it a transformation of translate by padding along the x-axis so i'm going to give it an attribute of transform and again remember transform is a set of instructions that we can give it so do we just want to translate it and if I open the bracket and we want to move it along the x-axis by padding so I'm just going to put padding right here and in terms of the y-axis we're okay because this will line up perfectly so I'm just going to put zero here and then close the bracket so we'll translate it by padding along the x-axis and then zero on the y-axis I'm just going to put a comma here as well. So it'll be padding comma zero. So if we save it now, we've got the Y axis that's perfectly lined up right here. So now we have a working Y axis and working X axis. And if you look here, we've created a G with the ID of Y axis, just like they asked. So I'm just going to run the test now. And yeah. We, have, we now have passed user story three, which is my chart should have a G element with a corresponding Y axis. Excellent. So now if we look at user story four, what it says is both axes should contain multiple tick labels. So that's these little things here. And it needs to have a corresponding class of tick. Now, if we look at these elements, what we can see is we already have these class equals tick things. And this is because the D3 axis bottom and axis left methods already take care of this for us. So if we look at the tests, we've already passed the user story four. So we don't need to do anything further with that. So if we look at the next user story now, we're on user story five now. And what it says is we should have a rect, which is an SVG rectangle element for each data point, which is each item in the values array. And it needs to have a class of bar. So what we're gonna do is we're finally gonna draw some bars. So we're gonna go into the draw bars method. And firstly, we want to select all the rectangles in the SVG canvas. So I'm gonna run select all here and give the element type of rect as a string. And then I'm gonna call the dot data method and bind it to this values array. And what that does is it associates all rectangles in the SVG area, even if they don't exist, with this values array right here. And then I'm gonna call the enter method to specify what to do if there are items in the array for which there are no rectangles, which is all of them at the moment. And we want to run append to create a new rectangle. Okay, so that should create a rectangle for all of our array items. It also says that it wants us to set the class of the rectangle to bar. And I, I can call the attribute method on this. Remember, we're just working with this rectangle selection. So I'm gonna set the class to bar. 
And finally, I'm going to do one last thing where I'm just going to set the width because the width is constant. So we can just set it right here. So I'm going to set the attribute width to, and let's have a look at how we should set the width. So we want to split this width here between all the bars. So all the bars should have equal width and it should be split evenly. So this width here should be split evenly. So this width here is width, which is this whole SVG area width, take away padding here and take away padding. So we have width take away two times padding. So I'm gonna do width take away, take away two times padding. So now we're left with this and we want to split this so that each bar, which is a rectangle for each of these items in the array, have equal width. So we want to split this distance right here between the, num between the number of items we have in our array. So what we can do is, since values is the name of our array, we can divide this by values.length. And this will give each of the bars an equal width. So what we've done now is we've created all these rectangles, as you can see from the console. The only thing is we can't see them because we haven't set their coordinates, so we haven't positioned them yet. But you can see for each of the items that were in here, we've created a rectangle with the class of bar. And it's also set the width to a constant amount, which is basically this width divided by the number of elements. So now, because we have a rect with the class of bar, we can just try it running the test now. And look, we have, my chart should have a rect element for each data point with the class equals bar. So that's that user story done. Perfect. So now we are looking at user story six. And what it says is we should have a property called data date and data GDP containing date and GDP values. And we're also gonna tackle user story seven and eight here. So that says data date should match the order of the provided data and data GDP should match the order of the provided data. So these data date and data GDP can just be attributes that we add to our bars. So to do this, we'll call the attribute method. And firstly, we'll give it the data date. And remember the callback function for the values can take in either just the item or the item in the index. But in this case, the input is just one of these items right here. And we wanna set data date equal to this date right here. So what I'm gonna do is if we have item, which is one of these rows, what we want is to return what's at index zero, which is the actual date itself, since we're setting the date attribute. So we want to return item zero. Next thing we're going to do is set the data GDP. That's another attribute. So we'll set data GDP like this. And again, we have a function that takes in one of these items. And this time we wanted to set the GDP, which is stored at index one. If we look here, it's at index one. So we want to return item one this time. If I go ahead and save that now, and if we look at our rectangle bars, one second. going to refresh this. Okay, so if we look at our rectangle now, we have the data date set to each of the date fields and the data GDP set to the GDP field. So we have this and this set to this and this. So that should fulfill user story six, seven and eight. So let's just have a look. So if we have a look right here. So yeah, the data date and data GDP values have been set. The data date is matching the order of the provided data. The data GDP is matching the order because we set them like this. And yeah, so that's those user stories completed.
Okay, so now let's look at doing user story nine. And what it says is each bar or each element's height should be accurately representative of the GDP. So now we're going to start setting the height attribute of our bars. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down here and we're setting the height attribute. Remember, an SVG's height attribute tells it how tall it's going to be. And this is going to be a function that takes in one of these items in the array, so one of these. And what we wanted to do is we want to scale it proportional to its GDP. So we've already created a scale called height scale here. And what we want to do is we want to pass in a GDP and it to generate a value within this range. So what we can do is we can return and we can call height scale as a function. And we want to give it the GDP, which is stored at item index one. So we want to return height scale item one. If I go ahead and save that now. And if we look at our rectangles, as you can see, the height right here varies. And uh, this has been set automatically. So if we look at the ones with a low GDP, so 243, the height is at six. And if we scroll all the way down and we look at a high GDP, like 17,000, the height it has also been changed to 520. So the height will reflect the GDP. And we can also begin to see our bars in the left here. So we will be positioning them shortly. But that should be user story nine completed. So let's have a look. Yep, so each bar element's height accurately responds its GDP. Perfect. So if we look at user story 10, what it says is the data date attribute and its corresponding bar elements should align with the corresponding value on the x axis. So what it's essentially asking us to do is put the bars in the correct places along the x axis. So this is where we need to set the x SVG attribute of these. So I'm going to go ahead and call the attribute method. And this time we're setting the x attribute. And again, we'll give it a function that takes in the item and the index this time, since the x value, like we said before, will be based on the index. So the higher along on, of an index it has, the more we want it to be towards the right. And the lower the index, the more we want it to be towards the left. So we can use this x scale that we created that uses the index right here. And what we can do is we can return and then we can call the x scale. And remember, we can take in an item and an index and we want to just call this method with the index. So I'm going to go ahead and save that now. And now look, our bars have been perfectly separated along. As you can see, the last bar is at the very right corner of the graph and the first bar is at the very left. Yeah, they are upside down and we'll fix that next. But yeah, they've been correctly separated along the x-axis now. So if we go ahead and run the test. Yep, so the user story 10 has passed and the bars are aligned correctly on the x-axis. So let's look at actually inverting these bars now so that they, they grow upwards. So this is where we'll look at tackling user story 11. And what it says is the data GDP attribute and the corresponding bar should align with the value correctly on the y-axis. So we want to start bringing these down. So here we're setting the SVG y attribute. So I'm going to call the attribute method and give, give it y this time. And again, we're going to give it a function that takes in one of the items from the array. So how are we going to go about doing this? So remember the y coordinate represents the y coordinate of the top left corner. So we're looking at the top of each bar and we have to think about how far we want to bring it down. Now the way to do this is if it's right here, we want to bring it down by height minus padding which gets it here. So the top of the bar will be here and the bar will be going down like this. And then if we push it up by whatever the height of the bar should be, we'll have the bottom of the bar right here at the base. This will become clearer, I think, once we start looking at this. 
So what we want to do is we want to first push it down. So we're going to return. So we want to push it down by height and then push it back up by padding so that the top of the bar will be here at the axis. So we'll do height take away padding because remember positive y means going downwards. And then if the top of the bar is here, what we want to do is if we push the bar up by the same amount as its height, then the bottom of the bar will be at the bottom of, at the axis right here. So we want to push it up by height. So if we look at calculating the height, we've already calculated the height like here. So what we can do is we can use this to get the height of the bar and we want to push it up. So we'll do take away. So what it'll do now is it'll calculate the height and then push it back up by the height. So just a rem final reminder, we pushed it down to here, then we pushed it up to here, and then we just pushed it up by the correct height. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this and see what happens. So yeah, just like I said, we pushed it down and then up just by the right amount. So that now the bars grow upwards and they're kind of starting to look like a proper bar chart now, but definitely we should have uh, fulfilled user story 11 now. So I'm gonna go and try it. And if we have a look, yeah, user story 11 has been completed and the bars are now aligned correctly on the Y axis. So let's look at user story 12 now. And what it says is I can mouse over an area. So if you put our cursor on top of one of these bars, you can see a tooltip which has an ID of tooltip and displays more information about that area. So what we're essentially gonna do is when we put our cursor on any of these bars, we'll have a tooltip that displays, and what I'm gonna display is the date right here so they can see the exact date. And now there's a few annoying things about the way this challenge is done. For some reason, you can't use a D3 title attribute which already puts a tooltip in because of the way it's marked annoyingly. So what we have to do instead is we have to create a div here and set it to be invisible. And then when we put our mouse over it, we wanna set its text content and then make it visible. So let's do that. So the first thing we're gonna do is create a tooltip. So we're gonna say let tooltip equals d3 dot select. And here's another annoying thing. We can't create the tooltip on the SVG canvas for some reason. Because of the way it's marked, it has to be created on the body. So I'm going to select the body and then we're going to append this. And the tooltip is just going to be a div. And we're going to set the ID, so the ID attribute to tooltip, which is what they wanted. And we're going to set the visibility to hidden. So this is a CSS property. So I'm just going to put visibility like this. And I'm going to put it as hidden. Now I'm, here I'm also going to set the height and width to auto as well so that it resizes automatically. But again, I don't think you have to do this, but I'm just going to go and get it out of the way now. So I'm going to put width auto and height auto. Now the reason I'm calling the style method and not the attribute method is that we are working with CSS height and width here, not D3. So not SVG, sorry. So what we have to do is we have to use the style method to set these properties. So if we look here now, we have this div with an ID of tooltip that's just been created right here. It's just got nothing on it. So what we want to do is when we put our mouse over this, we want to change this visibility to visible. and We want to set the content inside the div to this date right here. So D3 has this thing called on, and what we can do is we can use this to assign event listeners. And again, this is not taught in the curriculum which is kind of annoying because I had to just learn this myself. So we would say on, and then for the first argument, we would give it the event name. And the event name, when we put our cursor over something, is called mouse over. Note that we're doing this on the rectangle. 
And as a second argument, you can pass in a function that takes in one of the items in the array, and we can tell it what to do with that. So here. So now we have one of these items in the array. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is we want to make this tooltip visible. And we can't just reset a style attribute by calling style again. What we have to do is we have to call a trans... trans uh, what was the word? Transition, that's what it's called. So you'll say tooltip.transition like this. And this tells it that we're going to change some of its style properties. And then we'll say dot .style. So this is what we wanted to transition to, and we want to put the visibility to visible this time. So when we hover our mouse over one of the rectangles, the visibility of this tooltip should change. And now, as you can see, the visibility now says visible. So if I refresh the page again, it was hidden to start with. If I put my mouse over these, it becomes visible. So what we're going to do now is we're going to set the the content inside these div tags and we're going to set them to this date right here. So we have a date here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say tooltip dot text and remember the d3 text method sets what goes inside these div tags or any set of tags that we provide and we want to set the text to so if we have item here which is one of these array items, you wanted to set it to item zero, which is our date string. So I'm going to say item zero, like this. If I save that now and run it, we can see that the text of the tooltip has been set and the text now displays the exact date of the bar that we have our cursor over. So now what we need to do is we need to create another event for when the mouse leaves. So we'll say dot on, and this time when a mouse it doesn't hover over an object anymore, this is called mouse out. So it means the mouse has moved out of the element. And again, we want to call it a call a function. And what we want to do is we want to transition the tooltip, and we want to set the visibility back to hidden, so it we hide it, and we can put this as hidden here. So if I save this now. If we are hovering over it, it, it's visible with the date. If we move our mouse out of it, it becomes hidden again. It should be user story 12, so I'm going to try running that now. And if we look here, yep, user story 12 has now been completed. So now we're on to the final user story, user story 13. And what it wants us to do is add a data dash date property to our tooltip and set it to the date of that area. So you might think that when we mouse over it, we can call the attribute method to do this, but this isn't accepted either because of the way it's marked. What happens is when we use the attribute method, the D3 will get rid of this extra, there's a zero in these months and D3 gets rid of them and the marking looks for this exact zero. So we can't use the attribute method because D3 removes this extra zero and that will cause it to fail. So what we want to do instead is we want to do this using plain JavaScript. So I'm going to do document dot query selector and to query selector we can give it a CSS kind of query and it will select that. So we want to select the tooltip that has a unique ID of tooltip. So I can just give the CSS selector for that, which is, hang on, hashtag for ID and then tooltip like this. And what we want to do is if we are setting the data date attribute like this, we want to call a function so we we call a JavaScript function called set attribute like this. And what we do is we pass in two items. So one is the attribute we want to set, which is called data date. And the second is the value we want to set it to. And we want to set it to this. We want to set it to the data date of the area, which we set to this. So we want to give it item zero. So again, if we look at data date, that's item zero. So we want to give it item zero like this. And if I save that now, 
So let's have a look. If we look now, this tooltip has a data date that corresponds to whatever the uh, the date was in the array element for each bar. So that should be user story 13 now. So I'm going to run this. And yes, we have completed all of the user stories now. So our graph is fully functional. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and apply some CSS styling to this and I'll be back. Okay, so what I've just done is I've added some CSS. So I've just changed the font. I set the body in HTML to take the full height, set some background colors, and just mainly just been setting the colors. And I also changed the font size of our title. So if we look right now, it looks a little bit nicer. So it's blue background. And yeah, I think it looks a lot better. Um, I've also added a hover effect so that when I put my mouse over these bars, they just turn black to indicate which bar we are looking at. And yeah, nothing should have changed about the the tests, so it should just be just as functional as before. So yeah, that is just the end of this project. So we've just taken this JSON data and we've created this nice bar chart over here. So now you can go ahead and add this into a code pen and submit it. And what I'll do is I'll also put the source code for my solution as well in the description so that if you run across any problems you can just look at this and follow along. So yeah, thank you for watching.